Well, welcome uh, to you all. Thank you very much for your patience. If you wouldn't mind letting the rest know within the chat, we've kept it open there on Livestorm and uh, our Fonterra team will be letting uh, our registrations know that we've moved across to YouTube. Uh, I'm just going to get uh, my lovely team to send me a link to the YouTube so I can see the chat on the right hand side. Kia ora, welcome uh, to the Farm Source uh, Best Calf Practice Live Q&A. I would really love to know that you're all here along with us because we have a fabulous lineup of guests today uh, that are here that's jumped across onto the YouTube link. Thank you very much. We're having a little bit of technical trouble there with Live Storm. So whilst um, I introduce our guests, if you wouldn't mind just letting me know that you're there in the chat, you can hear me okay. And of course, we'll, we'll utilize this on the YouTube chat for our questions and answers. So I'll just get that link sent through to me. So as we said, today we're going to be providing you with the chance to ask your questions uh, of our experts because it's a great time to connect now as you've been drying, dried off by now and heading into, of course, a calving season ahead that's actually seems like ages away, but will be just around the corner in no time. Calf rearing is becoming more and more of a broad subject. A lot of the calf rearing Q&As we've done in the past with Farm Source, huge emphasis on setting up our replacement cows for the future because, of course, so we have to start with the future in mind to produce the best quality cow. But in this particular one as well, we're also going to be talking about setting up our dairy beef calves for their best future as a, uh, an, an opportunity for us moving forward on farm. So there's a lot of things to cover off around hygiene uh, and biosecurity, transitioning them slowly, uh, of course, into the shed and then uh, and out into the paddock after weaning as well. So uh, I'd just love to go to our panel. I'm going to start with our very special guest today, if we can bring up on screen, Professor Rebecca Hickson. She is the Dairy Beef Development Manager at Fonterra. Uh, Rebecca is a cattle scientist specialising in dairy beef. She's just come to Frontier actually from Pamu with research and expertise spanning the system from bull selection and genetics through rearing to finishing and meat quality. Uh, there's a lot. I've just got to do a little plug in the dairy exporter, all about dairy beef. And of course, we've ho highlighted a lot of Rebecca's research and work. So when it comes to setting up our dairy beef calves, um, Rebecca's going to be right here for all your questions. Known to many of you, uh, we're going now to our senior vet for Fonterra, Mike Shellcrest. A lot of you will know Mike from a lot of the previous Calf Week events and works really closely with the Fonterra On Farm Excellence team. Lots of great calf rearing guides and videos uh, that are up online with Mike, so welcome. And Carla Rawson, you have to be kind on Carla, she's... Um, uh, hasn't been too well, but joining us uh, from home, National Sales Manager for NZ AgBiz, everything to know about a uh, calf milk replacer. She's reared over 4 million calves by herself over the past six years. That's incredible, um, Carla. So let's just say she knows a thing or two about rearing calves, that's for sure. So I'm just going to head over here and double check that I have got a link sent over to me. Um, Claudia, if you wouldn't mind sending me that YouTube link, um, then I can at least see your chat. So because I would love to know where you're all watching from around the country uh, this lunchtime. So if you want to put in the chat, what location are you in at the moment? I'd love to read through and see that you can hear me as well. Okay, dokie, I'm just double checking that there. That's wonderful. Make sure I'm on mute so I don't hear myself back. That's always a good trick. Look at this. Oh, good. Thank you, Jude and Chelsea, for letting me know that we're all up and running and Paul's talking in from uh, Pukukaui. So, yes, that, we'll leave that um, other link there if we can communicate with those that are across there in the live storm. So my name is Sarah Perriam Lamp. Proud to be here today. Best practice calf rearing is what we're talking about before we get into this awesome topic, I have to make sure that you are well aware, you may have skipped over the details at registration, that if you are watching, uh, you are in the drawer to win multiple different prizes to the amazing Country Mile brand and the NZ AgBiz Calf products as well. We've got lots of uh, calf milk, repl uh, milk replacement products in terms of um, prizes. We've got prebiotics. We've got all sorts of things there that you can go on the win and even some Ecolab products as well, I understand. 
So all of the information on that will be in your registration. Right, let's cut straight to the chase and we're going to go to our seasoned uh, live streamer, Michael Shellcress. Michael, welcome. Uh, for those who don't know you, could a little bit of a brief on your day-to-day role. Oh, yeah. Hi there, Sarah. Um, g'day, everyone. Thanks for um, sticking with us here. Uh, so I, I'm a veterinary program manager in the, the on-farm excellence animals team within FarmSource. So that's trying to kind of look at what is um, good farming practice and, and how can we help uh, support farmers um, to, to kind of improve standards of care uh, for their animals on farm uh, in, in relation to this topic. Um, it's yeah, how can we ensure that our calves are reared in a way that they are able to turn into the to the best um, the best adult animals kind of at the end of that. So best best dairy cows or best beef animals. Fantastic. And coming over to you, um, Carla, getting warmed there by your beautiful Arga. I can see be- behind you. How long have you been rearing to rear six million calves? Let's start there. I would have to give away my age, Sarah. <laughs> that, that might be. Uh sensitive information and, and what's your day-to-day role within um, NZ Ag Biz and uh, supporting our farmers and our rearers? I uh, work in the sales team for NZ Ag Biz so the main focus for our team is to support our retailers and our farmers ensure they get a really good understanding of our products um, and how to get the best out of them so um, a real big focus is in training people in the stores as well as um, supporting farmers on farm with um, best practice advice. Coming to you um, next, but we're just wanting to say hello to Katie in Taranaki, uh, Ella in Tolaga Bay, uh, Nat- Natalia in the Manawatu and Vanessa in Cambridge, as well as Alicia in um, Natia. Great parts of the world. Thank you so much. Oh, and Julie's joining us from Porirua, so some great places there. Now, of course, our very special guest is Professor Rebecca Hickson. Rebecca, we'd love to know your history and how you've come uh, to your role in Fonterra. Can you give us a little brief? Um, well, I'd better start with I grew up in Tolga Bay, so shout there out you to go. Tolga Bay. Um, I have spent the last or 15 years at, at Massey doing various research in, in dairy beef. Um, particularly around, you know, how can we make better use of this amazing opportunity of surplus calves coming out of the dairy industry that, you know, we can make a really good beef product out of. Um, and then the last couple of years I've been at Focus Genetics, which is a subsidiary of, of Palmer, looking at their opportunities for their beef breeding program and in particular their dairy beef program. Um, I suppose if we're going to start in chronological order, and particularly we've got to focus here today on dairy beef, Rebecca, can you just set the scene for our calf rearers watching and listening, the importance around the, how far it goes back for the dairy farm on genetic selection with dairy beef? Um, so there's a, a big opportunity in dairy beef to use particularly our lower end dairy cows, who we didn't want a replacement from anyway, um, to get a high quality beef calf out of so because there's an opportunity to use ai and dairy there's access to some really really good genetics um and we know that you know putting in a good bull versus putting in an average bull can put an extra 60 kilograms carcass weight on the hogs um or take you know 13 days off days to weaning in the milk feeding phase and you know every calf era i know would be quite keen to have calves that reach weaning weight 13 days earlier um so yes bull selection is where it starts really for, for dairy beef. And we'll, we'll discuss a lot around um, the opportunities for calf rearers and, and where that um, pinch point lies as you discuss. But Michael, I mean, we are now at the early June. It does feel like it could, could be uh, a long time away in terms of shed preparation, those calves hitting the ground um, and coming into the sheds. But I mean, thinking about things now is so crucial, isn't it? Yeah, Um I mean, for some parts of the country, carving's only six weeks away, um, so it's it's going to come around pretty quick. I think the yeah, in terms of setting yourself up for success, um, the sooner you can do things like prepare your calf sheds, the sooner you're going to you know you the more time you've got to fix any problems that you you might identify then. But the other thing I think is is really worth thinking about, particularly this year, is um, is your carving paddock 
selections and trying to match those to your expected calming spread because we've had nationally a, a really big improvement in reproductive performance in the dairy herd over the last season and um, that is going to result in a material impact to to people's calving spreads and that will mean you've got more calves early on uh, on average um, and you're going to need more feed early on for for the calves and for the cows and if you keep doing the same thing you've been doing for the last 10 years um, then you may find that you run out of feed uh, sooner than you anticipated so so I would really encourage people not just to to you know, do the physical planning around setting their calf sheds up, but do the, um, I guess, the planning on paper, recheck your feed budget, make sure you've actually allocated enough space for calving paddocks um, because you you may find you chew through them too quickly. Well, great advice, um, Michael. If When we're talking about shed hygiene, are we the fundamentals of setting up sheds? It's a learning experience every single year and you sort of have always hopes to have written it down around what you'd do differently. What are you seeing some of the uh, most efficient and uh, great hygiene sheds do? We've probably all learned a bit more about um, disease control over the last few years and and the idea that if something is dirty, um, you, you cannot disinfect it. Um, so if, you've, if, you're, if you're going, you've got some, you know, shitty walls in your shed and you're spraying them disinfectant it's actually not going to achieve anything you need to to clean those surfaces first but also anything that gets you know that touches those dirty surfaces is now also dirty and and can spread um infection to to the next pen or to the next calf and so it's it's thinking how can i structure my shed how can i manage my processes in a way that reduces the chance of me touching a sick animal and then going and touching a well animal or, or the equipment that I'm using, you know, the calf feeder or, um, you know, the bucket that you're carrying um, hard feed around and or something like that, your boots, all of those things. How can you avoid those touching sick animals or being near sick animals and then being near healthy animals? Um, you know, a, a calf, calves are, are kind of naturally have high levels of bacteria that they shed. It's oft, usually not a problem. Um, sometimes it is when it is, it's around how do, how do you, um, I quite liked the, um, analogy that was used at, at, at a Palm open day kind of late last year that, um, you know, the country is an Island. So we've got biosecurity around the country, around the borders of the country. If you now think of your farm as an Island, you need to have biosecurity controls around your farm. Your shed is an Island biosecurity. You know, there's another opportunity to put a layer of, of control around there. You, each pen there's, provides another border that you can you can strengthen, um, and then each animal is is an island in and of itself. Great analogy. Um, I'll just stay with you there, Michael. I, I mean, we've in the prize pack. We know we've got some of those Ecolab products, um, the virus, the Kinecox, some of those things like coccidiosis and rotavirus, and not very nice at all. Uh, and I just wanted to um, pick up on some of the questions that have come in prior to, to the Q and A. Um, one wants to know just about, you know, how often should you be spraying the shed um, and that pre and during? The You can't disinfect a turd is um, a way of saying this, that, you you know, if, if something's dirty, just spraying it with, um, you know, the, the disinfectant will, will maybe will act on the surface of, of the dirt, but whatever's trapped underneath, um, it, it won't impact that. So more important than spraying um, disinfectants around is actually cleaning hard surfaces and designing your shed so that it can be cleaned. If you've got a shed that's made up of, you know, it's, it's all um, rough sawn timber, it's pretty hard to, to disinfect that. Um, if it's got solid partitions, it's, it's often e- is easier to kind of scrub down. But all of that is hard work during calving season and um and, and probably in most cases is is only a, a marginal gain so you you're probably better off putting your energy into into better other biosecurity practices so keeping your your clothes and your equipment clean um cleaning your calf feeder properly not not just a little bit but properly with hot water and and disinfectant um 
you know, not storing calf milk in a grubby, you know, 200 liter drum that's, that's, you know, it's got flies floating on the top and stuff like that. Those are all things that you can spend your time and energy improving those practices. Don't worry about um, spraying virus oils around most of the time. Now, in terms of, you know, when the bedding gets wet and, and shitty, top it up. Don't, you know, don't think that you can disinfect it. Uh, Rebecca, you've had a lot of commercial experience in calf rearing. How important is that um, shed preparation and, and some advice from your learnings? Um, one thing I, I will say is once it's full of calves and you're, you know, you're flat out, so your opportunity to do things and get things right is first. Um, and once you've got, you know, problems in your shed and you've got sick calves, you know, the more sick calves you've got, the busier you are. And so getting it right to begin with is a heck of a lot easier than trying to fix it up afterwards. Mm, great advice, Carla. Just with regards to that importance um, and what you've seen in the past and some really excellent examples of shed hygiene and preparation. I think um, most of the pig rearers now are very thorough. They understand that um, if you get your shed set up well, you've got good ventilation, you've got the right amount of calves per pen, you've got nice, clean, dry facilities. It does make a real difference. And I really have to reiterate what Michael said, like every pen needs to be treated like an island um, and everybody needs to be very careful, like, wearing gloves even if you can to ensure that you aren't passing bugs around the around the shed because um, as we know is once the bugs start spreading it does become a lot of hard work for everybody. One sick calf is one too many. So um, yeah, if we can take the time at the beginning and get it right on hygiene, I think it makes a huge difference. Um, thank you, Carla. I know you you haven't been too well and that you're struggling to chat to us, so thank you very, very much. Um, I'll go light on the questions to, to you, but, but fabulous. Uh, I'm just wanting to jump in here and quickly say hi to our other guest, Pauline, uh, is talking to us, uh, sorry, jumping in here from Northland, Charlotte from South Canterbury, welcome. I'd love if you have in the chat, you know, uh, what particular parts of calf rearing you're most interested in? Are you uh, dairy farming and rearing yourself? Are you a rearer standalone? Are you interested uh, more in dairy beef and, and the uh, requirements that dairy beef calves may need in comparison to set, it up, set them up for finishing? Uh, so, so so um, fire away on some questions there in the YouTube chat as well. Um, colostrum, Michael, we talk about colostrum uh, every single time because it is the absolute most important thing. The most fascinating thing I learned recently, Michael, was that a cow is the only mammal that doesn't pass good bacteria through in vitro to the calf yeah. like others. So it's so crucial. Yeah, not not. Um, there's a there's a a clever phrase around that as well about you know it's unfortunate that the you know the cow is the only species that does this. Now, it, uh, it, what it means if you look at all the other mam mammalian species, the the mother will pass some immunity through to um, the the offspring uh, prior to birth, but in cattle, just the the way that their um, placenta is formed, it doesn't happen. So uh, calves are unique in that, they, that that colostrum is the only way that they can start to build their immune system um, or, or, or speed up the development of their immune system um, shortly after birth. So, um, yeah, and, yeah, you can talk to farmers who, you know, who've, who've done a good job with their colostrum management um, and those calves can, can be standing in, in reasonably dirty conditions uh, and they still don't see signs of disease um so it, it is really important that that good first milking colostrum that's the gold colostrum the stuff that we you know is so precious that that is what gets into the calf you know quickly um quite in the right quantity what, what else have we got um quality. And, and quality yeah, yeah, yeah and, and squeaky clean um so um it is really important, and and I don't think it can be over emphasised or and or overly discussed. If you look at how colostrum is managed 
in non-seasonal systems overseas. It, it's treated with the kind of reverence and, and preciousness that it deserves, which is that um, you know individual cows colostrum is collected into um, a, at least a very clean, if not sterile, container, and then refrigerated or frozen or you know stored in some way that, that keeps it its quality. Uh, and then is is given to the calves um, when when they need it. It's a more complicated picture in New Zealand because of how many calves and cows and calves are left together for you know sometimes over twenty four hours, and so it's it's harder can be harder for farmers to know whether or not a calf has had enough colostrum, um, and that's that's kind of where the recommendation is is you know to be you know be cautious and just treat all the calves if they need colostrum. Um, but yeah, there's a big difference between in, in quality between um, you know that first milking colostrum and, and all other transition milk. So it is uh, ideally every farm would have a system for segregating that first milking colostrum um, and only keeping the really good stuff together. Mm. Um, interesting here, Alicia is um, coming to calf rearing for her first year from working with pigs, Michael. So I'm sure she's probably learned something interesting there with regards to how different cows are, um, Alicia. Uh, now coming to you, Rebecca, uh, what is best practice at, at scale that you've been doing in terms of colostrum management? Well, so I come at it from a slightly different perspective where as a commercial rearer, calves enter the facility at four days old. So that horse is bolted by the time I'm picking them up. Um, but I will say I certainly notice differences between different lines of calves in terms of their robustness. Um, and I would, you know, if if the dairy beef industry and this this pressure on calf rearing, we want calf rearing capacity to grow. So it's important that dairy farmers are taking care of their beef sale calves as if they were replacements and if they do all the things for those beef calves that they're doing for their replacements then those calves will go on into the rearing facilities as good strong calves. Um, Have you got research to show or uh, anecdotal experience in just the difference of how well that calf would do with good colostrum at the start versus not? Um, Yes there is. Um, and essentially it translates to a, a greatly increased risk of death, obviously, um, if a calf hasn't had colostrum, but also just early growth can be impacted as well. So, you know, colostrum really is, it's the centre. It's the gold, absolutely. Um, and, and of course, um, Carla would, would definitely back that up as well. Um, let's just, so, so we've got the colostrum into them within the first 24 hours, Michael. Uh, we've got our shed set up with our bedding and our house and our uh, disinfectant done. Uh, so in terms of those feeding options, what's the next step to transition as soon as they come into the sheds and in, in, uh, in both scenarios, both in a dairy situation as well as a four-day-old scenario as well if you're freshly getting them from the dairy farm? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and and this is, yeah. yeah, this is a really interesting topic because this is what calf rearers often want to talk about. You know, what's the best way to rear a calf or to feed a calf? And it really depends on the the different factors at play on your farm and what's the structure of, you know, are you rearing your own replacements? Are you rearing replacements for someone else? Are you rearing dairy beef? Um, those all impact the the time and resource pressures that you're able to, to devote to these calves. Um, the historical kind of driver behind calf rearing on dairy farms has been let's get these calves weaned off milk as quickly as possible um, and, and and kind of get them to that point with as little time invested as, as necessary. And that is, is helpful in the short term. You know, it means that you, you're spending, spending fewer hours rearing calves and, and um, you're preserving as much milk for sale as possible. Uh, or, or minimising um, milk replacer. The what that doesn't take into account is the potential long term benefits of actually feeding those calves really, really well. That that 
what are you setting these calves up for? If they're going to come back into a dairy herd, then you want them to be coming back as well-grown heifers um, who who are kind of have finished most of their growing uh, and are uh, and are well prepared to to enter the into the dairy herd and then get in calf again for for the for their, their second calving. Um, and then in the dairy beef space, you want them to be um, you know growing well right from birth not suffering any growth checks uh and and you know again when they're weaned off milk not not getting a growth check then as, as well so um increasingly over the last probably 20 years we're seeing research coming out saying the long-term benefits for calf rearing come from increased milk feeding so um rather than going how little milk can we get away with with and the calves are still alive um it's saying how what is the benefit to to feeding more and more and more and more milk and there will be a a trade-off at some point um but but uh, the kind of conventional wisdom around calf rearing i think is probably due for a bit of an update to just say hey look a higher milk feeding system gives you better animals in the in the longer term Mm. And and uh, Rebecca, thinking about it from a beef system, from the colostrum, but even terms of milk allowance, that calf is naturally getting what it needs from its mother in a beef system naturally as well. So when you put a dairy beef cross, are we not feeding these calves as much as they need for their genetics as well? Um. So so I think. There are a number of of ways we can look at that. So I'll I'll pull that back to firstly the transitions. So there's three major transitions in a dairy beef calf's life. So the first one happens at about four days when it goes into the rearing shed, um, and you know some of those calves are transported a long way. Some of those calves go via a sale yard. So it can be a really high stress point for those calves and open up you know, those calves to suffer a disease check and a, and a growth check at that point. And, and the diet transition is pretty significant if they're coming from colostrum straight onto calf milk replacer as well. Um, the next transition for them is from a milk diet to typically a, a meal and pasture diet. Um, and so, you know, that needs to be managed, you know, considering the age of the calf, considering the meal intake of the calf and considering the weight of the calves. And, and each of those on their own, don't tell enough of the story. You actually need mm. to put all three together and say, is this calf going to carry on growing when I wean it? Um, and then there's a third major transition for them, which is the 100 kilo calf leaving the calf rearing operation and going out to, to its finishing environment. And, you know, we think, we call them weaners, which is potentially a bit of a, a misnomer because, mm. you know, the beef calf by comparison stays on its mum till it's 200 plus kilos. And, you know, they grow really well, the beef calf, through that period. Um, And typically eating really poor quality pasture because we keep our cows, our beef cows, their job is to clean up poor quality pasture. So they get the worst of the worst in late summer, but their calf at foot still tends to grow pretty well. And the the difference is that those calves are being topped up with some really high quality milk from mum. And so when we take this 100 kilo calf and put it into hill country, we need to respect that it is still a baby and that it, you know, really should have still been on mum. And so we need to provide it with a high quality diet at that point. And high quality doesn't necessarily mean milk. Um, and, you know, for most systems, milk would make no sense in that scenario, but it needs to be, you know, the highest quality we can put into it. And farmers are having lots of success with um, lucerne, with, you know, chicory, white clover type crops. Um, or even just supplementing with meal. So mm. managing that calf through the 100 to 200 kilos is something that we need to work on in the dairy beef space because, yeah, we, we need to set those calves up better at the, their first autumn so that they can then grow for the rest of their life. Yeah, really, really valid point there. Um, just taking a step back with regards to a question that came through uh, about a, a lot of uh, people uh, considering more ad lib feeding based on what you've just said. What's your thoughts uh, on that in the, in, in the calf shed in terms of ad lib feeding systems? Um, for a dairy replacement heifer, it sounds 
fabulous. Um, for a, you know, maybe Mike's got a different view, so I'll, I'll let him comment on that. But from a dairy beef perspective, um, I have seen some operations that do that, and their calves are magnificent. Um, you would want to look carefully at your economics, would be the caveat that I'd place around that. Interesting. Michael? Yeah, I think that is a great way of summarising a lot of aspects of calf rearing, which are the compromises that you make uh, and the different drivers in different situations, and in particular with regard to economics, that um, you know you can make a, a gold-plated calf rearing operation, but if it's unaffordable to run, then it's not going to survive. And so it is It is just going, calf rearing involves lots of different compromises. It's important to understand the implications of them all before you make them um, because then you know which risks you're taking and which one, what, what you might need to keep an eye on. Is it, is it the, the bank balance? Is it the risk of disease? Is it, um, I don't know, the rate of growth? That kind of thing. Um, it, yeah, the 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 ad lib feeding is probably um, a, a good way to go from the calf's perspective, assuming that the the feeding process that you use involves clean milk. So you know, making one of those drums with lots of teats on it, you just fill it up, and the calves drink as much as they want, and then you top it up, and then you top it up, and then you top it up. You're going to end up with dirty milk in there. That's ultimately going to have a you know a negative effect potentially on on disease rates so uh it's remembering that there's ad lib feeding and there's ad lib feeding um mm. and then there are um you know you can get kind of mechanical ad lib feeders there there's a there's a more complicated device there um but they're still reasonably simple it's a drum and calves can drink as much as they want from it and then there are super expensive complicated ad lib feeders that will weigh the calves and will you know you can you can apportion you know record how much each one is drinking which helps you identify sick ones early like this it's a it's an interesting exciting space um but yeah if you think about what does a calf do in if it's aunt's mum it's probably drinking 10 or 12 liters a day so um if you're feeding less than 10 or 12 liters a day you're making a compromise um and that compromise is in the volume that the calf is getting to drink, which will mean it doesn't grow as quickly as it would uh, if it was on its mum. Um, Carla, one of the operations I saw was an automatic ad lib feeder with um, calf milk replacer. Are you, you see in terms of the milk allowance, making sure that they're getting it's you know that gold plated standard. But in terms of how much the economics would stack up with calf milk replacer, how much more milk powder are you using in a situation like that potentially? Um, the literature review that we've just recently had done by Dr. Kirst Elwiggins is actually probably worth sharing with the people that are on the call after um, the webinar is complete. But um, I think historically people have fed, fed around 10% of a calf's body weight. Um, but the research that Michael's referring to on a higher milk allowance is about 20% of a calf's body weight. So for a 40 kg calf that's eight litres of milk in the trials that were done with ad lib um, feeding systems um, in comparison the calves actually would drink more than eight litres a day so um, it's quite a lot of, of milk to Rebecca's point I suppose when you are um, managing economics um, it does it does stack up to be quite a quite a large amount of milk but on 20% of a calf's body weight, calves grow well. And in that first four to six weeks of a calf's life where their rumen is developing but they're relying on the milk as their source of nutrition, it's really important that you're feeding them enough. Um, from a dairy, um, like a heifer replacement point of view, the, <clears throat> sorry, the... Um, tissue that's found in the udder that um, produces milk, um, parenchyma, I think I'm saying that correctly, um, actually is shown that if you're feeding a good milk allowance in those early stages, you're going to 
Um, so you get more of that tissue in the udder. Even if the udder is around the same size, there will be more of parenchyma tissue in calves that are fed a higher milk allowance. In terms of, um, you also get a bigger framed cow. So it's also important because a bigger framed cow has a bigger gut, which equals more milk production. Um, in terms of the dairy beef, I, I understand what Rebecca's saying. Um, there was one trial that was done where you were seeing like feeding a good milk allowance, like a higher milk allowance versus low milk allowance. Also, solid feed was an important component of this trial. But the the cows, oh, sorry, the calves that were fed a higher milk allowance they did get to the 460 kg slaughter weight faster. So that was around 10 to 33 days faster. Um, and also to Rebecca's point, I think she's talking about getting to weaning weight, getting the calves um, weaned earlier. Um, if you can feed a good milk allowance, you will get to weaning weight faster. I think the key at, at that point is how you transition them from the milk mm. onto solid feed. They will obviously be eating solid feed throughout the time they've been on milk, but you want to ensure that you step down the milk. So ideally drop around 20 to 25% over a sort of three days at a time. So drop 25% in the first three days and then another until you take them completely off milk and or allow them to adjust from the milk, the higher milk allowance onto solid feed without losing any of the gains that you've made from all the hard work earlier in the process. Um, oh, that's really fascinating and I'm sure that um, we can circulate out that research and a link to the registrants um, afterwards. Um, Rebecca, I've got uh, some questions here. I'll come to your questions uh, shortly as well that carry on on this. but. You talked about those different transition points and the checkpoints that can happen. Um, what happens if you're buying four-day-old calves from a, a dairy farm that is feeding, you know, whole cow's milk until four days and then you put them on calf milk replacer? Is there anything there in terms of continuation of, of what they've been on? Or, or like if you had your hands on the whole process, what would it be ideal you know, I, I mean, ideally, you don't make rapid, you know, sudden adjustments to a calf's diet at any point, um, and, and especially when they're four days old, that's that's especially rough. Um, so if possible, you know, getting hold of some cow's milk to assist with that transition is, is a great option. Um, it's not always possible, um, in which case, you know, managing volumes, managing, you know, giving some electrolytes, making sure... The, the transition, you know, the moving process is as stress-free as possible. Um, all helps to just, you know, in, anything you can do to to not knock that calf around any more than you have to helps. Yeah, great advice. Um, Michael, I just wanted to talk wider around dairy beef and uh, also um, at some point too just around any, you know, updates this year from MPI. Um, but why is Fonterra you know, helping support rearers in the dairy beef space in this topic? Yeah, the, the, for those dairy farmers out there, you, you'll hopefully be aware that from kind of the start of last year, so a year ago, um, Fonterra changed our terms of supply to say um, we don't want people killing calves on farm if there's a um, alternative um, economic option for them so you know in most cases that's bobbying pet food or, or rearing for other purposes um, this is a I guess a, a wider social license risk for the dairy industry that, that the public you know in general people in general don't like the idea of, of killing young calves and you know kind of public accept- acceptance of um, killing of cattle goes way up once the cattle are a year old like it's that's it, kind of has been found around the world it's, it's interesting um and so if we want our cow our calves to to be entering a value stream um you know there's a there's a 
and we want it to happen quickly, um, Fonterra needs to be supporting bearers and, and dairy beef um, around the country to increase the, the options that are available to our suppliers. And Rebecca, when you were at Palmu, Palmu have set a target by 2030 to rear all of their dairy calves and dairy beef is a big part of Palmu's mission. Now you're at Fonterra. Uh, how possible is that and uh, what is your role going to be in Fonterra with that? Um, so my role at Fonterra is around developing the calf rearing for dairy beef, so making it easier and, and more functional for, for more calves to be reared. Because right now, you know, there's a real there's a real pinch point in the supply chain that says we just don't have the rearing capacity to to send more of more calves this way. Um in terms of, of how possible is it, you know, when you say oh, you know, it's nearly two million calves that we're we're not using um beyond four days old at the moment, it feels big and it feels hard. Um I sort of take the approach, well, how do you eat an elephant, you know, a teaspoon at a time? So for lots of farms, there is an opportunity to do something a bit differently, and it's probably a different thing on lots of those farms. Um, and, you know, what are the easiest next steps to take? So um, I, th- for me, it's less about going, how do we get to zero? It's about what are the opportunities? Because there are lots of really good cars currently going on bobby trucks that, that we should be capturing in the industry. So for me, it's about, you know, what are the, what are the next things we can do? And, and those watching, um, Rebecca, are really interested in, you know, the fundamentals of how to raise beef versus, you know, dairy beef versus straight dairy calves. Um, things like, uh, you know, do they, are they needed to be indoors longer, more milk, et cetera, et cetera. How, how should we treat the improvements in our calf rearing, do you believe? Um, what what are some of those fundamentals? Oh, we've been over a couple of them, but from your perspective? Um, I, I think fundamentally a dairy calf is not different from a beef calf or a beef cross dairy calf. Um, what is different is the economics and the long-term, you know, fate of that calf. So so for a dairy heifer, we're setting her up for a long productive life of a, of a milking cow, whereas for a dairy beef calf, um, you know, ideally we don't want that animal to to live past 18 months of age um, and we want it to be, you know, well-grown and, and delicious at that point. So um, we are trying to get slightly different things um, and we have different, you know, economic drivers. So I think the equation for feeding a dairy heifer calf more milk and for longer is easier to make stack up than for a beef calf. Um, And some of those things will, you know, the movement of animals through the supply chain in the dairy beef industry makes a lot of that harder, that often the calf era is rearing calves that, that they might sell, you know, in the store market at 100 kilos. And so whether they've reared them well or not, they're a 100 kilo calf and, and there's no extra reward for that. Um, so in a model where, you know, there's connections between the person putting in the good genetics, the calf rear rearing the calves well, and the finisher getting the benefit from that, then it, then it makes more sense. Um, and so building some of those relationships where, you know, if, if we can get better reward in terms of finishing performance from those calves, we need to have that connection that says, I want to buy the calves that have the better finishing performance. Yeah, there's a lot more to do beyond the uh, weight of the world being on the rearer themselves uh, in that discussion. Um, I'd love a couple more questions to come through before we wrap up. But um, Carla, your thoughts on this, you know, the size and the scale, the elephant, as Rebecca explained, you know, we have the ability, the knowledge and the skill within the industry to do this, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure um, Rebecca's, I think, talking to a lot of the big rearers themselves. I'd like, you know, this um, support and additional focus, I think, is, um, sorry, <laughs> will be really, really appreciated. Yeah. Um, just on um, the, going back a little bit, I'm, I'm sorry, um, but on one point, just on the colostrum to milk replacer um, transition, if 
because this is a bit of a challenging thing for a lot of farmers, if you do have access to colostrum slash transition milk, if you can combine the two, um, and like I think Michael and Rebecca have talked to, try and do the change, the transition as slowly as you can, um, depending on how much colostrum and transition milk, it will ensure that the calves do transition over a lot easier. It minimises the stress. So if you take out a litre of colostrum and transition milk and put in a litre of CMA and do that over the course of a few days, you'll find the transition a lot easier. We have a number of rearers also um, using our probiotic biosupport. Um, that's made at the Frontera Micro Fermentation Unit down in Palmerston North. It's um, got a lot of research, a lot of it actually in humans, um, that shows its beneficial effects for gut health and, and well-being. So a lot of calf rearers have found, especially in that first 10 days when the calves are sort of going through quite a few changes, it just really sets them up for um, for success. So um, that might be something as well to help with that um transition um especially if you don't have access to the colostrum and transition milk on a calf rearing unit um for those like alicia who are in their first year contract milking can you just explain michael uh transition milk and that whole process when you're on farm uh, yeah so the the technically colostrum only refers to that very first milking post calving uh, and then after that um, there it, it, it seems to be called transition milk and this is um, I guess as the other changes from making that really um, immune fortified syrupy colostrum to, to give the calf to, tra- to transfer the immunity right at the start um, through to making kind of milk normal milk and um, you know, there's kind of a people say, oh, you know, colostrum's not milk, and that's you're you're selling milk, so so that's why we've got this um, food safety kind of requirement that cows are kept out of supply for the first eight milkings, so that 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 first colostrum milk, which colostrum which isn't milk, doesn't end up in supply. Um, also, to manage you know antibiotic residues and allow cows more time to to transition uh, cleanly but um yeah it, like for people like alicia if she's got questions like get in touch you know farm source has got a bunch of of people whose job it is to help farmers do stuff and and learn stuff and so um you know that's that's why we do these these webinars it's why we have you know tsrs it's why we have people in regions who can come and talk to you about these sorts of things so um, definitely take advantage of the support that's out there don't be afraid to ask questions well said and I Alicia oh we're picking on Alicia uh, if she's still watching um every single one I do I learned something else I didn't know that there was transition but was eight milking so you know that that's incredible that and there's that extra supply there for the calves um I've got some good questions coming through Charlotte is there oh how am I going to put this one too uh let's go to Rebecca is there any truth that faster flowing teats are not as good for the calves' digestive system as it was thought, and that fast flowing teats can also mean that calves suck, mean more calves suckling on other calves? I'm going to deflect this one to either of you other two. I have heard that. So um, the ideal teat flow is two to three minutes per litre. Um, so there's a few things with your feeder you need to consider, like ensuring it's set up about 65 centimetres from the ground. Um, ideally, you want the feeder to be around the same height as the cow's udder, and you want the flow rate to be around that um, for optimal digestion because um, that will ensure the esophageal groove works correctly, but also with the sucking motion um, helps the salivary enzymes um michael might be able to talk more on what that actually does in terms of the digestion process but um there has been trial work showing that actually shows that that also helps with the curding um because you can use a high quality milk replacer like ancalf that's guaranteed to cure but you want all the other components working correctly 
too, there has also been trial work that's showing if the calf does drink slower, there's less suckling on, on other calves in the pen. Um, while you're on the colour question specifically for you, can you just mention what that prebiotic is again for Ella who was wants to give it a go for um, dairy beef calf rearing this year? So it's called biosupport and it's a probiotic. So the difference between a probiotic and a prebiotic is the probiotic is putting in good bacteria. So the particular probiotic that's in biosupport is Bifidobacterium animalis. Um, a prebiotic, like um, what we have in ANCAF, like um, it's called Actogen, is more like a sticky sugar and it helps rid, rid gram negative pathogens like E. coli and Salmonella attached to the, um, the Actogen molecules rather than the gut wall. So, in simple terms, um, the probiotics putting in the good bacteria, the prebiotics helping get rid of some pathogens. Fantastic. Um, I'll come to you, Michael. Nikki from Otri Hunger wants to know if you are unable to feed these larger amounts of milk and your calves start eating the meal well, given the calves are weaned off the meal very slowly before leaving the farm to go grazing, what should the maximum amount of kilos of meal be per calf? That is a great question. No one's ever asked about maximum meal. They always maximum. Have minimum meal. <laughs> minimum meal. <laughs> Yeah, um, the the assuming they're on pasture, they should be able to regulate their intake reasonably well as long as there's like enough fibrous feed because that's that will be the risk is is that you um, you don't feed enough fiber in their diet and so you compromise ruin function there. Now, if, if they've had if they've made the adjustment slowly, that's less of a risk. Um, but most farmers would go. I'm spending too much money on meal. I'm going to cut like the, the limiting the money will be the limiting factor rather than um, what the calf can actually consume. Um, I I don't know if that actually helps. Um, do you ha- Rebecca? Have you got any thoughts on the most meal a calf could eat? Um, They'd probably struggle to eat more than two or three while they're sub 100 kilos, but a big calf could eat enough mm. to make himself crook <laughs> or, or, or make the farmer's budget pretty crook. Um, yeah. The only thing I would say is, you know, like putting in more meal, don't do that suddenly. So if you've got calves who are used to eating a kilo or a kilo and a half and you decide you're a bit short of feed, don't suddenly allow them to eat a great deal more. Do it slowly. Mm. Yeah, good idea. Um, they're a bit like a Labrador. They'll just eat if it's in front of them. <laughs> Speaking from a Labrador owner's experience. Um, thank you very, very much. There's so many things. And as we uh, always say, that we could continue talking for hours within a, a live um, Q&A around calf rearing. So many questions uh, potentially coming in. Uh, sorry, just Nikki said, yes, the cows would be out in the paddock with hay without fail plus water. Good on you, Nikki. Um so thank you very much for joining us over your lunch break. Thank you for your patience with regards to our small technical difficulty there at the start. And, uh, of course, we will have this cut up, edited, and uh, created as both podcast and a video for watching back on demand. But as Michael said there, farm sources there to support you every step of the way. And so, of course, go in store, talk to your local TSR, reach out to the experts, head on to the website. There's a huge amount of calf rearing uh, videos tips and tricks that you can um, dive into but you know it, it's interesting the, the research is always evolving the learning's always evolving so um, every time you see one of these webinars pop in to see if there's any refreshed information as well thank you very much for taking the time head to nzfarmsource.co.nz and of course as you're registered uh, you may just get a nice little email pop into your inbox to say congratulations you won a prize so thank you so much for taking the time to come along on your lunch break enjoy